Hello and welcome to a spontaneous podcast of The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. We are on location at Warwick's Bookstore. Now, you've heard me talk about Warwick's, which happens to be one of our main sponsors. They're located at 7812 Girard Avenue in La Jolla, California, 92037. You can, of course, reach them online at warwicks.com. They are the sponsor of tonight's show, uh, where we are featuring Matt Coyle, the author of Doomed Legacy. And if you're familiar with the Rick Cahill series, then you're in for a super treat. It's a short, spontaneous podcast, but I think you're going to like it. Let's get on into the Thriller Zone. Matt Coyle, welcome to the Thriller Zone. Thanks for having me, man. Pleasure to be here. I will admit, and I don't get to do this very often, I don't know your work. I didn't know your work. You're one of millions. <laughs> how did we, how did our paths cross? Harris Horkin. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't even know that well, but um, I'm going to blurb his next book, and he's a nice guy, a good writer. And I mean, I, don't th- I think I met him in person once, but just kind of the way the business is, you know, people try to help each other. Yeah. Funny thing about Harris, side note, Harris reached out to me one day. I'm like, I don't know who you are. He goes, well, you probably know my dad, Dick Orkin. I'm like, whoa, whoa Dick Orkin? Dick Orkin was the funny guy of the 80s. When I was coming up in radio, he was doing the commercials for all the big radio ranch spots. Okay. Brilliant mind. Hilarious. So I, I'm like, you're on the show. And then I got to read his stuff, and he was a ma- magnificent. So I'm glad. Thank you to Harris for teeing yeah. us up. You know, it's funny. I, I am newer to your show. Uh, a few weeks ago, I caught it, and uh, I think you had Bob Crace on. Yes. Uh, and uh, so I... My publicist, I sent her, I screenshot it and sent it to her. And I go, this is a target. And then like two days later, friggin' Harris just comes out of the blue and says, hey, you guys should talk to each other. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. That's called synergy. Yeah. I love it. Well, and it's a small world. I just wouldn't want to have to paint it. So <laughs> Anthony Award winner. That's pretty nice. Here's what I love. Uh, rumor has it that, and I, and I was doing a research on all the California thriller writers, crime writers like yourself. And I'm like, okay, well, there's Michael Conley, there's Bob Craze, there's, yeah, James Elroy, as far back as Raymond Chandler. And I'm like, and they're putting you right up there at the top. Well, there was one very nice, maybe a couple nice critiques that have, have, uh, say that I'm hanging below this gentleman. But um, those are all people who are my idols. Bob Crace is uh, one of my favorite contemporary writers. Michael Connolly, of course. Um, and Bob is kind of, because Michael blurred one of my books, but Bob has kind of helped me a little bit behind the scenes in ways he doesn't even know. So, I mean, that's just the way we were talking earlier about Harris. That's the way this, this mystery community is. People really help each other. It's really cool. Nice thing about Bob, I have followed him for years, and I, I don't know what I was expecting when I met him. He was just so down to earth and so real and so nonsense about everything and which reflects his style and then when i started speed reading your first couple of chapters as i was preparing for today i was like oh wow i can really chew into this guy because that style that minimalistic shred out every ounce of fat elmore leonard minimalism is so and great well thanks um there's another you know elmore leonard that's a nice Nice to mention him as well. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny when I go back, because I'll be reading tonight, or, or, um, every time that I'm, I read something, I go, I'm editing. I go, why didn't I edit this? The, you know, I could have cut 15 <laughs> words in the first uh, first page. Um, and speaking of Robert Crace, I heard him say the same thing one time. He, he goes, man, I, ne- I never stop the editing process, and I, I completely agree. Isn't it funny that you, and how many edits do you think you go through? Oh, shit. I do... <laughs> I'm, my my first draft is very um, organic, open, wild. I put everything in. I don't care if it's not very good. Um, so I revise probably four to five times. Um, some are pretty quick. Like the first one, I'll slash maybe 20,000 words or something. And then um, fine tune. Um, the book I'm writing now, not Doom Legacy, but the next one that uh, comes out next year, I actually am adding in my in my further draft something a little different. But, I, you know, I don't... I try not to worry about it. I try not to worry about, whoops, went the wrong way. I just, you've done this before, keep plowing. But, um, yeah, I do quite a bit of revision. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's been said by many great writers that writing is, re- or revision is writing. But, yeah, and there's not, generally it's not a huge, like, story edit. Yeah. But there's some little little twists here and there, but it's always taken out those words that yeah like Elmore Leonard, Elmore Leonard famously said the words that people skim over but you know it's hard to always find them I think someone else that does that is probably James Patterson 
This is my favorite uh, note that I got. So yesterday's Echo wins Anthony for Best First Novel, San Diego Book for Best Mystery, and the Ben Franklin for Best New Voice in Fiction. This is all on the debut novel. I, I mean... I got to say, the Ben Franklin was a silver. They, they, it was a silver medal, so it was it was like the runner up. But 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 everybody gets that wrong. But I I can't feel like I can take credit for the, okay. for the gold. Yeah. Anyway, I interrupted you in the middle of your. No worries. I think I got that right off your website. So I, I'm not surprised. Okay. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, and this is just me being me. I'm like, you know, I I think I can write halfway decent. I'm like, how does a guy come out of this with a debut? And then I go. Well, what was he? What was Matt doing? Well, he must have been in school this whole time. He must have been writing, writing, writing. But you had many other careers. Yeah. At the same time. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a stretch to call them careers. I had jobs. <laughs> um, I worked in the restaurant business for ten years. I worked in the golf business for ten years. Then I got into sports licensing, and uh, that was the long one. I worked there for sixteen years, but I wrote six books while I was working there full time. But, you know, the reason, and thanks for the kind words, um, you know, a lot of the awards is kind of luck, but, you know, I, that was, it took me 10 years to get published. It took me 10 years from writing on a floppy disk, writing on an IBM ThinkPad used, yeah. a floppy disk drive. I call it writing in a cocoon because I didn't know anything about, you know, yeah. I've read the genre my whole life, but I didn't know anything about writing a book. I had chapter one on the first page. I had the end on the, you know, the last page. And I thought I'd written a book. I'd written a first draft. Yeah. But... I revised and revised and revised. I took classes. I was in writer's groups. So all that time, all those revisions, all those no's, all those rejections made me a better writer. If I would have somehow gotten picked up earlier, um, wherever my career is now, I don't think it would be on the same level because every rejection, you know, I, had, I, was, I, was, I, was, doing, I was doing the wrong thing, they say, because I, I was writing my first book over and over. And sometimes they tell you, you know, give up. You know, you're being rejected by the marketplace start something new. Yeah. And I just started something new when I was rejected by an agent who was kind of like a C agent that I don't even know if she's gotten stuff published since. Yeah. But uh, my mentor is Carolyn Wheat and I sent her the, the rejection. It was a very nice rejection. She told me where she thought I was coming up short. So I sent it to Carolyn and I said, should I go one more time with this book? And she said, send me $500 in the manuscript. I'll let you know. And I did. And uh, she gave me nine or 12 pages of single space notes. And two years later, I got a, I got an agent. And then seven, six months after that, I got a book deal. But all that revision made me a better writer, you know, because you're, you're, you're using the muscle. It's forcing, yeah. it, you know, you can only get better at anything by yeah. um, repeating it. And um, it's so easy to look back now because it just seems like a flash. But during the, during the time, there's yeah. a lot of, uh, you know, I was in sales most of my careers our jobs yeah and uh, so I'm used to rejection but they weren't they were rejecting my company's product they weren't rejecting stuff from my gut so right but it helps to, to have that background but um, I'm so thankful for it now that for every rejection every ignore I got so I finally had to get to a certain level what do you think is the toughest thing that most writers face today that they go oh like if you could just go okay just take a breath be patient and this one thing right here that you're really hating because it sucks so bad and it hurts or it's aggravating or it's tiring, just get through that and you'll be okay. I think you, you nailed it in the question. Be patient. Yeah. And that's the hard thing, um, especially in today's world. Yeah. You know, everything is so instant. Yeah. It takes years and years to, to develop craft and it takes years and years, you know, the whole, the, the nebulous thing, voice. Yeah. Um, I didn't have a voice until I, you know, I was probably stealing from Chandler a lot. I didn't really have a voice until probably three or four years in writing that first book. It takes it takes a long time to develop these things. And it's not something you can really aim for. It just comes with the constant writing and revision. It's, nobody wants to hear it, but be patient. And, you know, there's plenty of writers. Um, I've known writers in writers group that I thought were incredible writers. But they just quit after a while because it's hard. You yeah. know, better writers than me. But they quit because it wasn't. They didn't have to do it. I have to do it. I mean, I wanted to do it my whole life. Yeah. It took me 30 years to realize you got to write to become a writer. And then once I finally did, you know, I can't stop. I mean, some days I hate it. Most days I hate it, but it's what I was born to do. But, you know, if you don't have that, man, it's so hard. There's so much rejection. There's so much, I'm not going to say negativity because everybody's pretty, they're not necessarily doing things in a negative light, but there's a, a lot of no's. You have to develop a thick skin and you got to remember why you're doing it. And you're doing it because you have to, and you love it. Yeah. All right. 
So before we get you out there to do your gig tonight, let's talk Doomed Legacy, which sure. drops tonight. Yeah. Uh, tonight being uh, the 15th of November. This, sh- this will air a little bit later. But uh, let's talk about that book. Uh, since I have not read it, because we really pulled this together on the fly like 48 hours ago. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about me giving in any spoilers. Good. But uh, what's the story about? Well, uh, first, quick background on Rick Cahill. He's a former cop in Santa Barbara. Uh, about I think about 18 years ago, his wife was murdered. He was arrested for the murder. Never tried, released, but never, never exonerated. And thought by many to be the guy who got away with murder. Whether he, he didn't do it, but he feels responsible because of the actions he took the night she died. And so he's carried that, um, that cloud for all these years. And he's become a private detective back here in his hometown of San Diego. Couldn't get a job anywhere else. Um, and he's got that need to try to redeem himself. So every case he takes, he's kind of this quest for redemption. And in Doom Legacy, he's had a hard life, old Rick. He's, he's, in the last book, Last Redemption, he was semi-diagnosed. You can't diagnose this until the person's died with uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the pro football disease, CTE. Yeah. And, and it makes sense because of all the violence in his life. And so he's got that still. It's it, but he he's in a place where he's never been before. He's got a he's got a wife and a child. A child he thought he'd never have. You know, his first wife died. The woman he married uh, was unable to uh, conceive in her first marriage, and so he's got all that going for him. And his life he's, he's finally reached the point in his life where he's happy. He's he's working, um, doing just background checks for a big corporations. So there's no chance of getting injured. You know, getting shot which right. has happened to him many times yeah. his wife's happy about that but he's got this disease it's gonna his life's gonna be shorter but he's also got a new um symptom of it which is this uncontrollable rage which is a real thing for yeah. cte yeah i happen to know somebody who was with someone who had it and he almost killed her wow and so he's got everything in front of him and then he's got this anger that he can't control it's gonna could blow up his marriage he's kind of hiding it from his wife he's trying to so he just takes off whenever he feels it coming up. So, but he has a situation where he doesn't hide it well enough, and the wife takes uh, the daughter Leah or Crystal rather up to Santa Barbara through her family. And so Rick's back with his dog, his trusty dog, um, midnight back to the family he's had. It's not like they've broken up, but they, she's away for a bit, and um, he takes a case uh, for one of his clients um, in the HR department for this um, defense contractor. But they have a civilian side and a defense side. And there's a specific agency. Um, I have it written down, but it's not in front of me. There's a specific agency in the, the governmental agency that does background checks for potential employees for the defense side. But on the um, other side, for the civilian side, there's um, Rick does background checks for this company. It's, it's a good living for him, along with some others. And she has this kind of, she asks him to help, it, help, him, help her with some, it seems like an inner office politic thing he's like why am i getting involved in this right but he does it because they're sort of a friendship and he he doesn't want to piss off somebody who stirs um, steers business this way right so uh she ends up getting raped and murdered and by a serial rapist that's around in southern california and rick because when something like that happens something he knows he has to get involved he doesn't feel responsible for this necessarily but you know, I was working with her when this happened. I have to get involved. So sure. he, he bumps up against the cops, un, unsurprisingly, and they don't want to have anything to do with him. And ultimately um, kind of bumps heads with these, uh, a very secretive detective agency, a um, mysterious uh, shell corporation, and uh, the defense contractor. And, of course, a uh, meticulous murderer. Yeah. Yeah. That's the that's the main thrust of the plot. But for me, the, the most important thing is always the, the Rick subplot is, can he overcome this, these anger? It's not even anger issues, it's rage. Yeah. Can he overcome that? And can he get his family back together all the while trying to um, solve this murder? One thing, uh, by the way, that was brilliant. One thing <laughs> I think I felt like I was stumbling over the place. No, no, no. Yeah, I'll fix it in the mix. <laughs> okay. What I learned, now, like I said, I went to a, an online resource to read an excerpt of your book. Yeah. And inside of one page, literally, I did not move the page. I learned, I gathered enough from that, who he was, what he was suffering from, this bond with the child that was magical, the fact he had a dog. So I was like, I was one page in and I'm in. Oh, cool. That doesn't happen every day. 
And uh, it happens even less than I say. <laughs> so that was great. Yeah, it's a delicate balance when you're writing a, a series. Yeah. And this is book nine. For Rick, everything carries over. When I started writing the series 20 years ago, yeah, when I didn't know anything, um, I wanted every action and bad decision that Rick made had to matter. So the things carry over from story to story, not necessarily storyline, but his, his history does. And so the challenge for me is when I'm doing a new book, I don't want to have spoilers for new readers, but I want to give them enough for them to have an idea of what's going on. And I don't want to bore my old readers. Right. I'm glad that you, you said that. It, it, that is the thing. I'm like, is it too much? Is it not enough? So it's always something I, I um, think about. And I, that, that's got to be one of the hardest things of all to do, but you did it so deftly because... I was able to capture his entire world in five paragraphs, and I I was up to speed cool. enough that I'm like, okay, if when I get some free time, I want to sit down and read more of your work. It's you know when you're doing two to three uh, a week, it's hard to read two or three books a week Absolutely. and so forth. Okay, Matt, what do you say we take a short break and insert a commercial? Uh, who is a sponsor of our show and sponsoring tonight's? Uh, podcast which will air tomorrow on wednesday does that make sense for everyone <laughs> take a short break and when we come back we're going to find out matt's best piece of writing advice you know it's one of our favorite questions here on the thriller zone so stay tuned for that we'll be back with more matt coyle right after this stay with us hi i'm julie slavinsky i'm the director of events for warwick's bookstore so julie tell me what sets warwick's apart from like everybody else in the country well, I would say number one is our customer service. That's our number one thing is that we want to take care of our customers. What's like that signature thing? You know, like when you go to Tiffany's, they have a Tiffany box. And if you go to Macy's, they have a Macy's bow. What's Warwick's little thing? There's not really a thing that's tangible, but it's more how you are taken care of when you come into the store. And we want to make sure that you have a great experience, whether you're in our gift department, our pen department, or in our book department. Whatever you come in for, we've got something for you. One thing I've always liked about this store is when I walk in, the way you guys make me feel. And that's, to me, one of the signature things. So and that's been for generations for this store. We're a fourth generation owner. Nancy Warwick's a fourth generation owner. And... As a community bookstore, which is one of our signature things, is that we are a very big part of this community, and everybody loves us just like we love our customers, and we take care of them and make them feel like they're part of the family, too. For those celebrating the holidays, what have you got coming up for uh, the rest of the holidays? As the events person, I'll talk to you about events. We have lots of things coming up. If you're not on our newsletter email, you might want to do that because you'll get notification of all of these things. Just go to warwicks.com, and you can sign up for our email. I'm Julie with Warwick's, and we are so appreciative and love the Thriller Zone. And now, back to the show. Hi, Matt Coyle. I write uh, the Rick Cahill Crime Series. My latest book, Doom Legacy, just came out, and I have the pleasure of talking to David Temple on the Thriller Zone. All right. All of this is a great lead-up to the final question I have. I know we've already touched on it, so we can uh, approach it as though we haven't answered it yet. Or you can go, oh, but I got something else for you, David. And that is this. What is your best piece of writing advice? And it, it doesn't have to be singular. It can be multifaceted. But so many of my listeners really are up-and-coming writers. or they're, like, they're, they're some of the people that you talked about earlier. They're struggling to find out, do I have what it takes? I think I can do it. I just need that one piece of advice. I mean, I'm finding out that so many of my listeners listen for this one piece right here. Oh, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, for me, it's simple. It's, you have to write and you have to, as I said, I 30, I want to be a writer for 30 years. I never did it. I do it. I did it when I was inspired, which is good for about three pages for me. So you have to get a routine if you can try to write every day, which I do when I'm under contract and write when it's hard, write when it's easy, write every day, but read your genre. Absolutely read your genre. That's really important. And if you're thinking down the line to, to becoming an author and, and what you do, go to book signings, do things like that, um, go to conferences. There's plenty of great conferences in the mystery community. But um, you have to write. And some days, I, there's nothing easier for me to do than not write. Yeah. And some days I sit there in front of the blank screen and I think, well, you're, you know, you're, you're has been, you, you fool people for eight books, but now, you know, it's going to happen. They're going to know that you, you're no good. And I sit there and then I type away a little bit. And generally it might take 
45 minutes an hour. But some of those are my best days when I just fight through it, fight through this shit, and push yourself and you'll find you'll find a wellspring of, of ideas you never thought you had and also revise revise every day the stuff you wrote the day before it's a great way to get yourself back in the story and know and, and know that when you're a beginning writer your first draft is going to be horrible in fact when you're not a beginning writer your first draft is not gonna be very good um the great john lasquois once said um i give myself permission to write like shit when I write a first draft. And I do too. <laughs> and he didn't even have to tell me that. I was already doing it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, just write. It sounds stupid, but it's the thing to do. Work your muscle. We were talking about it earlier. Yeah. Um, force yourself. And, and if it's an hour a day, that's fine. There's plenty of days, I'm sure, when all of us aren't doing it. But if you force yourself that hour a day, you, at the end, you're going to go, well, you know, I got something done today. Yeah. And you feel better about yourself. I've used this analogy before, and for some reason it works, especially with your background. I think you're going to get it. And I say to my friends, they're like, hey, you want to go play golf? Oh, I suck at golf. Well, when's the last time you played? Four years ago. Okay, well, then you're never going to get good. Get out of my face. <laughs> but if you take a club, any club, one or two clubs, and you just go out there, not an hour, not 30 minutes, how about 15 minutes a day? Yeah. And you just work on that muscle memory. You're going to automatically get better. Absolutely. Same thing. I'm just going to go out and drive it. I, I don't care if it looks bad. I don't care if it whips to the right or to the left. You're, you're honing it in. You're figuring out what works. And that's what I tell people about writing. I mean, well, why do we think, well, I should be able to get there and write a really great chapter for the first go. Why yeah. would you think that? <laughs> yeah. It's going to be terrible. Yeah. Um, but I would also suggest getting into a writer's group. Uh, if you have beta readers, that's fine. But writer's groups are fantastic. Beyond having someone else critique your work, you're forced to critique other people's works so and it makes you think more about the, um, you know, what you're doing, the yeah. craft. Okay, Matt, I know you have to go. Thanks for having me, man. Pleasure to be here. They're waving us on. You have to get on downstairs and get ready to do the show. So thank you so much, folks, for joining us for this impromptu and spontaneous podcast pre-recorded at Warwick's in downtown La Jolla. Uh, thanks again to Matt Coyle and his remarkable book, Doomed Legacy, which drops right now. It's available right now. And I want to say once again, thank you to Julie, the events coordinator, and Nancy, the owner of Warwick's here in La Jolla, California. We appreciate all that you do for the community. And of course, we appreciate your sponsorship of The Thriller Zone. Um, we're going to take on off. We'll see you next time for another exciting edition of The Thriller Zone. Okay.